I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate it. So um, I'm going to tell you a story this morning. Uh, when I first became a Christian, and uh, I hadn't grown up around the Bible, hadn't grown up around all the stories, and some of you grew up going to church, but uh, I was not one of those people. And when I first became a Christian, I was absolutely blown away by some of the stories that I started reading in the Bible. And maybe because I didn't grow up around Christianity and I didn't grow up going to church, I just kind of really got amazed by these stories that I was reading. And one of the stories that absolutely overwhelmed me was about this man named Saul of Tarsus. And so I want to tell this story this morning by simply taking you to the Bible to be able to tell the story. And then we're going to pull some things together because this man is going to start a journey. Now, he's been going down one particular road, but God is going to give him an about face that is very dramatic in his life, and it's going to totally change everything for him. And I can remember the first times reading this story, how amazed I was uh, about what took place in the life of this man who started out being known as Saul of Tarsus, meaning he was from the city of Tarsus. His name was Saul, but we're going to know him better as the Apostle Paul, the most prolific writer in the New Testament, a man who penned, uh, according to some, about 13 of the New Testament books, has Paul's fingerprints all over it. But the way he started out and the way he ends up is just this remarkable journey. And we're going to be on that journey for the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at some things that take place in his life. But I really wanted us to focus today on Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, we're being told the story of what happens in Saul's life. And the guy that is writing this book is a man known as Luke. And Luke is one of the apostles. He actually was with Jesus and Luke is a physician by trade and so he's known as the beloved physician and Luke is going to tell this story of the conversion meaning the complete change in the life of this man formerly known as Saul of Tarsus how he becomes known as Paul the Apostle so when I became that brand new Christian the first place that they really started letting me teach was I got to teach on Sunday Sunday nights and uh, as I began to grow in my faith and I was teaching small children and as I was teaching small children I just started creating stories to be able to keep them engaged and by the way that first group that I work with were called the eager beavers all right so you know nothing like a room full of children and eager beavers and telling Bible stories and you know I could be in the room full of adults and I could finish telling a story like this and I would say to any of you have a question and it, they would be very reticent adults are to raise their hand but you do a Bible story like this in front of a group of kids and you ask them do they have any questions man alive every hand in the room goes up right and so I enjoyed leading those eager beavers so I hope you're going to be a bit of an eager beaver today uh, when you listen to this story about this man named Saul his conversion experience and what it has to do with with your life today. So Acts chapter 9, we're going to begin in verse 1. Now it says, Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, talking about Jesus, and he went to the high priest. And he asked the high priest for letters from him to all the synagogues in Damascus. Now, Damascus is a city in Syria. It's probably roughly about 100 miles from Jerusalem. And what had taken place was there was all of this persecution that was going on against Christians. And so they started dispersing themselves to different places. Some of them were going to go to Damascus. Others of them were going to go over into Turkey. And so there was just all of this dispersal that takes place of the early believers in Jesus Christ because of the persecution. Now, the persecution is coming 
believe it or not, from the most religious people of the day. They were known as the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And Paul had been raised as a Pharisee. And he had been trained under the what, two of the greatest teachers, really, Gamaliel. And then his father before him, Gamaliel's father, was known as the rabbi in Israel, Hillel. And so there's this distillation of all of this tradition and all of this Judaism that's been deposited in the life of this man known as Saul of Tarsus. And so this new guy comes along named Jesus of Nazareth because he was in the village of Nazareth. And so when Jesus started preaching a different gospel, he started preaching something different, the Jewish people became enraged. And the religious leaders were the ones that are most vehemently opposed to Jesus. And so that little movement got started. Jesus was crucified, and all of these people started coalescing together, and now you've got a religious movement that is taking place, and Saul of Tarsus believes, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God has called him to help put out that fire. He believes that God has called him to go there and to persecute these people that are Christians. And so in Damascus, there was a very thriving community of Christians, and that's why he goes to the high priest and he says, I want you to give me letters that I can take to the leaders in the synagogues up there in Damascus so that we can go and try to find out if there's any people, notice it in the verse, so that if any be found belonging to the way. That's what they referred to early Christianity as. They, they referred to it as the way. Both men and women that he might bring them, notice this, bound to Jerusalem. So he has authoritative power to be able to go there as a Jew, to be able, in essence, to arrest these people that are Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem, and to try them on charges of being blasphemers against the faith. And so Paul, at Saul, is very, very zealous. He believes, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that he's doing what God has called him to do. So he's on his way there. He's got the group with him to help back him up. And it says, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly there was a light from heaven that flashed around him. Now, this is during the, the midday hour that this takes place. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, this is Paul, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and go and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but they saw no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and the, even though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him in to Damascus. So here's this proud Pharisee that believes he's doing the right thing, that he's going to go and he's going to help to stamp out this new movement that we call Christianity, that they call the way, and on his way there, he's struck down by this blinding light. Now, I told you last week that, you know, we often refer to this as a Damascus Road experience. And even people today, when they have some massive change in their life, when they have some massive change in direction, they'll say something like, well, I had a Damascus Road experience. And so Saul is going through this experience, and think about it. He had these letters from the high priest. He had the people with him with the power to be able to arrest those other people. And all of a sudden now, all of his power is taken away from him to the extent that he finds himself blind. And he hears that voice saying to him, when he, when he says, Lord, who are you? That's when the voice speaks to him and says, I'm Jesus. And I'm the one that you are persecuting. But I've got a plan for your life. I want you to get up. And I want you to enter the city, 
And when you do, then I'm going to tell you what comes next. And so Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor he drank. So Saul of Tarsus is coming to a crisis inflection point in his life. And it's where he's going to have to make some decisions, and he's going to have to make some choices. And his decision and choices result in the spread of Christianity. It results in the majority of the New Testament that you and I get to read. It is a remarkable experience that he goes through. And as God is putting him through this experience, I sometimes hear people say things like, well, you know, I wish that I could have a dramatic experience like that. I just wish that, you know, that God would just come to me in a flash and tell me exactly what to do. I'm not sure sometimes that people have fully read this story if that's what you want. Because Saul is so struck by this situation that he's not going to eat He's not going to drink, and all of a sudden, this man who is so proud, this man that is so powerful, is being taken by the hand and led into the city. Now, the story goes on from there. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus who was named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. You know, anytime God presents himself to us and we just say, Lord, here I am, be very careful because the Lord may be getting ready to ask you to do something that you never thought in a million years that God would ask you to do. And so when he says, here I am, the Lord said to him, I want you to get up and I want you to go to the street that is called Straight. And I want you to inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Do you notice how specific God is in the story? He tells him what street to go to. This is better than Uber, trust me, and GPS. I mean, he says, I want you to go to the street call, you know, the street call straight. I want you to go to the house number with a guy by the name of Judas, and he's got a guest there inside of his house, and he's from Tarsus, and his name is Saul. And then he tells him, for he has been praying. Now, let me tell you why that's so important. Because Ananias knows exactly who Saul of Tarsus is. Everybody was scared to death of Saul of Tarsus. Word had gotten around. Word had spread about how this man was persecuting Christians. So imagine being Ananias and God coming to you in a vision and saying to you, I want you to go and confront and to be with the man who's been persecuting all of these Christians. And so God sets him up by saying, now, he's been praying and he's seen in a vision that a man named Ananias will come in and lay his hands on him so that he might receive sight. But Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man how much harm he did to all of your saints that were there in Jerusalem. And here he already has the authority from the chief priests to bind everyone who calls on your name. You know, there, there's nothing wrong when you feel that, that God is leading you to do something. There's nothing wrong with questioning and trying to get to a point of comfort. And that's exactly what Ananias was attempting to do. And so as he continues to pray and talk to the Lord, the Lord said to him these amazing words, I want you to go for he is a chosen instrument of mine. How odd that must have struck the ears of Ananias. How in the world could you call a guy that's been persecuting Christians and remember, Saul was the one who had stood one day when they were going to kill the first Christian martyr whose name was Stephen. And Saul, talking about that experience, said, on the day that they were going to stone Stephen to death, 
I stood there and held the cloaks as they took off their cloak to pick up the rocks to stone Stephen to death. He said, I stood there and I held their cloaks. That's why later on, Saul will describe himself as being the chief among all sinners. Because Stephen was a godly man. And Stephen was stoned to death that day. And Saul of Tarsus stood there and held those cloaks of those people. And here God is saying to Ananias, this man is an instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. Let me tell you why that's important to every person that's in this room today. Because if you are not Jewish, then you are a Gentile. You, you are not from the tribe of Judah. And so God is saying here, I'm getting ready to give the gospel, not to just to my chosen people, the Jews, but I'm getting ready to give that gospel to the Gentiles as well. And so he's going to be my voice. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And you know what? Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul the apostle in this experience, knew that he was going to suffer. He said, I, I know a lot of things that are going to be in my future. But he was willing to take it on. And so Ananias, in verse 17, he departed and he entered the house. And after laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, he has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight. And when he regains his sight here, I'm one of those people that believe when Paul talks about having a thorn in his flesh, he also says, you know, I have a sin that besets me, not just sins. And I've come to find out that nearly all of us has a sin, a weak area in our life where the devil always likes to come and tempt us, where he likes to be able to come in and trip us up in our life. And so I believe that Paul's thorn in the flesh was that he had eye issues because of this blinding light. And perhaps maybe he had retina issues. As a person who's had that, I, I can only imagine what he would have been going through. And so immediately then, those scales fall from his eyes. He regains his sight. And then notice the next part. And he got up and he was baptized. He got up and he was baptized. He was baptized into a totally different type of faith. And he took food and he was strengthened. Now watch what happens and begins to take place in his life. Now for several days, he was there with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. Now put yourself in the seat of those synagogue leaders in Damascus. Saul of Tarsus had letters from the high priest the most powerful person in the church that said that Saul could come there and he could take prisoners, these people who were professing the way, but now here Saul is, he's a part of the way. He's become a believer in Jesus Christ. And all of those who were hearing him continued to be amazed. Why, why were they amazed? It tells you. Because they said, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed all of those that called on this name? I mean, his conversion is so dramatic that it's shocking people. That how in the world can he move from this position to that position? And let me tell you what, there were some people who didn't believe that it was true. There were some people of the household of faith thinking, well, is he just somehow, is he going to turn around then and do a role reversal? And then he's going to take us in and he's going to take us in chains back to the city of Jerusalem. But they were amazed at his teaching. Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed all of those who called on this name and who had come here for the very purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? 
But Paul kept increasing in strength. And he was confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. The word Christ right there, it's a Greek word, which means, you know, the anointed one. But in the Older Testament, that's the word Messiah. So what he is saying here, he was proving that Jesus was the Messiah. He was saying, we've been waiting on this Messiah, and I'm telling you, Jesus is the Messiah. Now, when many days had elapsed, then the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul. And they were also watching the gates both day and night so that they might put him to death. So you remember the Lord had revealed to him in a vision, you're going to go through some horrible things. And Saul was on for the trip. He was willing to say, Lord, whatever it is that you have in the cards for me, I'm willing to do it. And Paul develops this um, amazing character quality of resilience. And no matter what he faces, he's able to take it on. And I mentioned the word to you last week. It's the word courage. And, and we're going to talk about it. Remember last week I told you there's three things that will hold you when you're going through difficult times in your life. It will be your conversion experience, how you came to know Jesus, and your story becomes that thing that you hold on to. No matter what you're facing in life, you know how the Lord saved you and redeemed you and how he loves you, and that helps you to go through whatever you're facing in life. But then I told you the second thing that he had was courage. He had this incredible courage. And then the third thing that he has is he has great companions around him. And you're going to see those companions begin to come into effect right here. Because the Jews want to put him to death. But, verse 25, his disciples took him by night. And they led him down through an opening in the wall, and they lowered him in a large basket. Now, I know some of you are thinking, and that's probably where we get the term a basket case. Well, maybe it is, right? But they lower him down over the walls because now it's the Jews that want to destroy him. He came there to destroy the Christians, has this magnificent conversion experience, and now the Jews are trying to destroy him. But they helped to get him out of the city. And when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but watch, but they were all afraid of him. They were not believing that he was truly a disciple. They were sitting there going, how can we be sure? This is where a companion comes in. I can't tell you how important companions are. How important friends are in your faith journey. And Paul is going to learn this example. And then you watch him throughout all these missionary journeys that he does. He does three primary and then he does one secondary missionary journey. He always has companions with him. He never does ministry by himself. He always includes other people. But they're scared to death. But Barnabas. Barnabas is a guy who continually shows up in Scripture. I would like to think that I could be a Barnabas in life. The, the word Barnabas means son of encouragement. Don't you love it when you got someone who encourages you in your life? I mean, I love encouraging people. Somebody that just has the right word in the right moment that's there to encourage you and to keep you going. And so Barnabas comes and he took hold of him. He took hold of him, and he brought him to the apostles, and then he described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. In other words, you've now got Barnabas being a benefactor. You've got Barnabas stepping into the breach and doing something for Saul of Tarsus that he could not do for himself. You know, I always think about when I was trying to get into college, and I had a terrible academic record. And I'm, you know, 22 years old, trying to go to college. And I couldn't get in anywhere. And in just a miraculous situation, I met the dean of the university, not knowing she was the dean. 
And I shared with her why I was at the school that day. And she took me to her office and she said, uh, I'm going to become your patron, patron. I never heard that term before. And so I said, what does that mean? She said, that means you're going to come into this university under my name and not your name. And I thought, good, because my name was not working out very well. I've been turned down three times, and this time I show up in person, and I'm turned down again before I meet her in the stairwell. She became the advocate for him. She became his endorser, or he, she became my endorser and my advocate. Exactly what Barnabas is doing right here. And he's telling his conversion story. See, right here in the beginning of his life, this conversion story is being told. And it'll be told three distinctive times in the book of Acts. And so your conversion story, what was it like when Jesus saved you? And so he, then he told them how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them and he was moving about freely in Jerusalem and he's speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And as he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea, Caesarea by the sea, and they sent him away to Tarsus. They're sending him back home. And so the church throughout all of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace. They were being built up, and they were going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And then it says the church continued to increase. So when we see this conversion experience that the Apostle Paul goes through, he's going to go through so many different things in his life. He's going to go through a lot of heartache. And as he goes through it, he's always reminded himself of the day on the road to Damascus. The day that my life was changed. And that's what kept him going through all of the difficult times. And when you begin your Christian experience, it's important that you remember that time of your salvation. It's important that you remember that time when you profess by outward sign the inward change that Jesus made in your life by being baptized. It's important that you remember that being a part of a church is going to be vital to your Christian life. And in Acts chapter 22, when Paul is talking about his salvation experience, almost 16 years later, he's talking to a crowd where he's been arrested. His conversion experience was the most unforgettable experience in his life. And he sits there and he tells them about it. And in Acts 26, he goes back and he talks about it again. So Paul's salvation experience, the encounter he had with God, was the most pivotal point. It was the linchpin of his entire life because it's what he could go back to and he could look on it and he could gain encouragement by knowing I had a total transformation in my life. I developed a faith in Jesus. I became a brand new creation. I had an infilling of the Holy Spirit in my life. He became faithful to serve God. He became that person that would always relate back to his conversion experience. So I want to encourage you today, church, to think about that vital point in your life. If you've truly accepted Jesus in your life, I want you to think about in this moment right now, what was that like? I want you to reflect back on those experiences so that when you're down, and maybe you're down spiritually. Maybe you're down emotionally. Maybe you're going through depression. Maybe you're wondering if God really cares. When you're down, one of the first things that needs to come to your mind is the fact that Jesus saved you. And if you had been the only person that ever lived, Jesus Christ would have died for you. You are a child of God. And he didn't save you for you to stay down. Instead, he saved you so that no matter what you're going through in life, you can keep going. And so Paul, in that original vision, 
He said God told him, Jesus told him, here's some of the things that you're going to suffer. Here's some of the things that you're going to go through. So now you understand when Paul is writing to the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, he says, God is the one who comforts us in all of our affliction so that in turn we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction by the comfort which we ourselves have been comforted by God. And so what he's saying with your conversion experience is that God has saved you so that you might influence other people and so that we as a body of believers can be there to encourage other folks. So your conversion experience and then the courage that Paul had. You might say, well, you know, what type of courage are you talking about? I'm talking about courage in the Lord. You, you can't pass over what Paul was able to do. When you read about his life, when you read about his ministry and his boldness, it, it just stands out that Paul was this amazingly, you know, strong individual, which he was. But here's what I don't want you to think. It's unrealistic to think, well, Paul was never afraid. Of course he was afraid. In Corinth, Paul was having a great time in, in ministry. Uh, there was a man named Cyprus who was the synagogue leader, and his whole entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the people in Corinth were believed, and they were baptized. Yet still, while experiencing that success, Paul was struggling with fears that he had. And in Acts chapter 18, verse 9, it says, And the Lord said to Paul by a vision at night, Do not be afraid any longer, meaning that he has been afraid. You see, God doesn't do everything all at once in your life. And what I'm trying to say is spiritually you grow. As you begin, you know, as an infant and you begin to grow in the Lord. And so God tells him, I want you to go on speaking and do not be silent. So to me, courage is not the absence of fear. Instead, I think that courage is nothing more than fear that said its prayers this morning, right? We all have fears and we all go through things, but it's trusting God even when things are against you. It's moving forward even when you feel down and you feel downcast. See, there's a guy in the Old Testament that when he's spoken of in the New Testament in the book of Acts, he's called the man who was after God's own heart. And you know who that was? That was a guy named David, right? And David becomes the man who is after God's own heart. Listen to what David wrote one day in Psalms 43. Why are you in despair, my soul? Why are you so restless within me? Do you sometimes just feel restless? Do you sometimes just feel spiritually unsettled? And you feel like there's something missing. You feel like there's something that's just not right. Well, David, this man who was after God's own heart, went through these kinds of emotions. I want you to understand that just because you're a hero in the faith doesn't mean that somehow you're immune to all the things that we go through. And then David gave his advice, wait for God. And then he says, for I will again praise him. There's times that we don't feel much like praising. There's times that we can feel very, very discouraged. And yet, there's going to be a day when you're going to be able to praise him and you're going to feel that praise from the very core of your being. He says, for the help of his presence, my God. I'm going to wait for God and I'm going to praise him because if I praise him, watch the, co you know, the correlation, then his presence is going to be there for me. And, and that's my God. So you go back and you look at Paul. He was stoned at a place called Lystra. In Acts chapter 14, it tells the story there of different things that happened. There was a time that Paul encountered a man who had been crippled all of his life, and Paul healed that man, and all of these people witnessed the event, and they got so enamored by what had taken place. They decided that Paul was a Greek god named Hermes, and Barnabas was Zeus. 
And, and so they decide that they're going to turn around and they're going to worship them as gods. And Paul and Barnabas tore their clothes and they said, yeah, we are men just like you. We've come out to tell you about the living God. And they tried to do all of these things. And so what it did was it caused Jews that in the city of Antioch, that's the first place that Christians were called Christians, was in Antioch. And Iconium, they came and they were so upset that they stoned Paul. And this is that famous, you know, moment in Scripture where Paul says, I don't know if I died and I went to heaven. I know I had this out-of-body experience, and that's what, again, gives him his strength no matter what he's facing, no matter what he's up against. He goes back to these times. And so you've got this vicious mob at Lystra. And at that point, they thought Paul was dead. And they left him there. Just what they did to Stephen when Paul held their cloaks, now Paul's having it done to him. And the story's found, if you want to look it up later, in Acts chapter 14. And it says that when they had done this to Paul, while the disciples stood around him, they helped him to get up, and he entered the city. And the next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made a good number of disciples, they returned to Lystra, that very place, and to Iconium and to Antioch. And so while they were there, they won a lot of people to Christ. But the deal is, look at the courage that Paul had to do the right thing. And when our life is in danger and life is overwhelming us, we can get down or we can call on the courage that God gives to us and, and God instills in us. And so he had that kind of confidence right there. And where does that confidence come from? When you ask Jesus into your life, the third person in the Trinity comes to indwell you and it's the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and as far as the remotest part of the earth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 5, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God. And he's given us the Holy Spirit as a pledge. The word pledge right there means earnest money. When you and I are saved and the Holy Spirit comes in us, it's God putting down earnest money. Why do you put down earnest money? Because you're going to come back and redeem something. And that's what God does for us. And the moment that you and I die, God redeems the Holy Spirit that's inside of us and that's why physically we may die but spiritually if we're a Christian we never die we we never die and so Ephesians 1 13 in him Jesus you also after listening to the message of the truth the gospel of your salvation having also believed I love this you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of the promise you know what that means? That means once you are saved, you are always saved. Once you have nailed it down, once Jesus is in your life, once the Holy Spirit has come into your heart, he is never, ever going to leave you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's going to be right there with you. And so that's the courage that we have in spite of what we're facing, in spite of facing death. I went this past week, and I'm so glad that I did, to the home of Paul and Linda Powell, who are absolutely have been a precious part of this church. And Linda knew that she was dying. Her service will be on Thursday this week. She is one of the finest examples of being a Christian that I know. I never had a birthday, Robin never had a birthday, the kids never had a birthday, that we didn't get a handwritten card from Linda. I'm praying for you. I love you. 
Thanks for being my pastor. She always made me feel like royalty when she called me her pastor. And she told her daughter, I, I won't like to come. And you know, it's one of those things where sometimes your schedule is so full and there's so many things. And I got that message from her daughter, Amber, that morning. And I immediately called Melanie, my executive assistant. I said, Melanie, whatever I've got this, I know I've got a couple of meetings I've got to be in. But just clear my calendar because I, I've got to go and I've got to be there. And I went to the home, and, and you know what I saw? I saw a lady who was at peace. Her world was down to a square that was on her wall that had the pictures of her old home place and a mountain called Bell Mountain that she loved up in Hiawassee, Georgia. She had the pictures of her kids and her grandkids. And that wall became the space that she looked at every day in the last days of her life. You think she was afraid of dying? Absolutely not. And when I stood at the bedside and we gathered as a family and we prayed around her, I walked out knowing I'm not going to see her again on this side of heaven. But what courage, knowing I'm down to hours. And sure enough, the next day, she passed from here to there. All the sermons she endured from all these pastors. She now walks by sight. She doesn't have to walk by faith anymore. She walks by sight. All of those things. She's been a companion to me. Paul has been her husband, a companion to me. He's one of the elders of this church. One well, of the sweetest, kindest men I've ever known, Paul Powell. See, on this journey, we need people around us. We need the Paul and the Lindas. We need people that you know that you've already... See, what I know is when I get up in the morning, somebody's already prayed for me. You say, do you sleep in that late? No, I don't sleep in that late. Guys, I'll take this. But here's what I know. Somebody's already praying for me. And I can't tell you what that means to me. To know that somebody loves me so much that they're calling me by name. The other day in our staff, we do an all-staff meeting. We do all-staff meeting. Uh, we pray. We spend, a, we spend about two, two and a half hours together. But the first 45 minutes or so, maybe even close to an hour sometimes, is uh, we pray for a lot of you by name. If you're on our prayer list, our whole staff is praying. And we, and we sit and we talk about what, what's going on. How can we be there for them? Because we all need companions on this journey that we're on. And man, thank God for Barnabas. He steps in to that moment. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking now, Paul's back in Jerusalem. And now's when he's going to really begin his ministry. No. God is going to send him away to the desert for three years. Do you ever feel like you're in the desert? You ever feel like, I, I know I've got a purpose in my life. I know God's calling me to do something, but I, I can't seem to get there. You're in the desert. But can I tell you that God does things in your life in the desert that he could never do when you're busy. When you're so caught up in everything. He has a purpose. He has a plan for your life and for my life. Have you ever given him your heart and your life? See, it doesn't have to be a blinding light. It can be a preacher standing on a stage like this. You can be watching at home on live streaming. And that preacher, me, says, would you like Jesus to come into your life? And if you say, yes, I would, then I want to pray with you the very prayer that I prayed the day I became a Christian. You want to pray it? Just bow your head and close your eyes with me for a moment. I'd ask everyone to pray. And if you say, God, today, 
I want Jesus to come into my life. Just pray and say, God, I acknowledge that you exist. I believe on the name of Jesus. I confess my sin. And now I confess you as my Lord. God, help me to nail down my conversion today. And as you ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life, that's the courage part. That's what's going to give you courage. You're going to have dying grace even when you're taking your last breaths. You'll have his peace that passes all understanding. And because of that Holy Spirit being a pledge, the moment you stop breathing here, Linda Powell was alive over there. In that place called heaven. I confess my sin, Lord. Just tell him. And now I confess you as my Savior. You prayed that prayer today. I want you to know something. No matter where you are, Jesus Christ died for your sin, and now the Holy Spirit comes in to take over your life. Father, thank you for those that have prayed it today. In Jesus' name. Would you stand? As you're going to stand right now, we're going to sing together. If you need to come down and kneel and pray today, I invite you to come. If you need more courage today, and come down and just say, God, I need your strength. Don't try to do it on your own.